Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Joan Frank in conversation with Jane Chabatori. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and will also be your host for the evening. Well, Jane will really be your host, but I'll be here as well. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I'm thrilled to remind everyone that all nine of our stores are open for both inside service and curbside pickup. And I always like to take a moment in the beginning to thank each and every one of you for your supporting us through COVID-19. It's been such a struggle for indie bookstores and without the support of people like you buying event books, we wouldn't be able to put this free program on. So for that, we at Copperfields have so much gratitude. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce one of tonight's speakers. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, details for purchasing tonight's title, which will be a little different than normal. Um, we will include links to purchase previous works by Joan as well as my contact details for post-event information. The Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any questions or comments for the speaker. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please go ahead and submit here. We appreciate that. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our first guest of the evening, Jane Chabatori. Jane is the author of the short story collection, Stealing the Fire, a regular contributor to BBC Culture and Lit Hub, on the advisory board of the Story Prize, Lit Camp, and the Bay Area Book Festival, a Pushcart Prize contributing editor, a member of the Writer's Grotto, and a co-founder of the Flash Fiction Collective, a San Francisco-based reading series. What, an, what a resume. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight, both of you, especially you, Jane. I know it's really late there, so I'm not going to take any more time. Why don't you take it away for us? Oh, it's not late here. I'm in Sonoma County. Anyway, it's hello. Thank you, Jamie. Um, hello to all of you who are joining us on Zoom in this Zoom universe this evening. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with Joan Frank tonight in a virtual conversation. Thank you to Copperfields for hosting us, for all of you for being here, and support your indie bookstores. Joan is having an extraordinary year as a writer, kind of a triple crown year, I think of it, with three new books, an award-winning novella collection, an award-winning essay collection, and a novel, which we're celebrating tonight. The last time I saw Joan read from her work was at Copperfields in Santa Rosa, in the flesh. It was this year she was launching Where You're All Going, her Mary McCarthy award-winning collection of four novellas. I'll bet some of you were there. Maybe you can let us know in the Zoom or the chat or somewhere because it would be fun to know how many. It was a full house that night. There were folks who hadn't seen Joan in a long time. There were reunions of sort and much celebration. Little did we know back then that a lockdown was coming and there would be, you know, we'd be still in place all these months later. But we can imagine that sense of anticipation and celebration in the room as the audience poured wine and snacks and settled in to listen and wonder. We're here, ready on Zoom, I hope with drinks and snacks, and ready to listen and to celebrate Joan's new novel. The outlook for Earthlings is well suited to now. In our slowed down times, quiet time for reflection, when we have time to linger on memories that surface, time to reflect where we've been, time to reread sentences or chapters. I've reread this book now three times. Time to consider how our own lives would look if examined under a lens like the one that Joan uses to explore the sometimes joyous, sometimes fraught, sometimes sorrowful relationship between Mel and Scarlett, two women who are, it seems, opposites yet drawn together for much of a lifetime. The Outlook for Earthlings is a book about friendship. It covers nearly 50 years. The opening and ending take place in 2013, then the narrative jumps back to 1964, and thereafter the chapters bounce around as memories do. We are witness to intimate scenes between Mel and Scarlett and the people in their lives. The nuances of feelings women friends can have, the crucial life decisions that could push them apart, the tragedies that can bring them back together. 
We glimpse some of the meat and bones of their lives with nuanced writing about sex and specific and moving descriptions of Mel's experience of cancer, the scarlet by her side. Tonight, I've asked Joan to present a kaleidoscope of scenes from her novel. This should give you a sense of what she calls her driving obsessions with time, mortality, the mystery of our existence and all of existence, and the ways in which her novel presents an ever-changing view of these two complicated, idiosyncratic, lovable women. But first, I'm going to ask Joan a question. What do you mean by your title, The Outlook for Earthlings? Well, first of all, thank you, Copperfields and Jamie, and thank you, Jane, for that wonderful introduction, which really got got my flames stoked. Um, the Outlook for Earthlings came in the course of, of a reckoning between the two women toward the end of the novel. And I always am very careful about titles. Titles to me are a tremendously subtle and powerful art. Um, you want to give some essence of the novel's heart in it, but you don't want to give too much away, and you don't want to be too jokey, um, but you want to enlist some spirit, some, some essential spirit of the novel. Um, the reckoning between the two women comes later, and Scarlett is surmising how Melanie is feeling about the world as she prepares to say goodbye to it. Um, and she knows that Melanie is not pleased with the world she's leaving, even though she would rather stay. And that it has disappointed her. It has disappointed her morally, effectively. I think she was hoping for better from the human species. In other words, we got a bad score. And Scarlett knows that Melanie feels this and regrets it with all her heart, the way we do feel that way about people we love feeling disappointed. But it's what is. And a lot of this novel, I'll get into it a little more later, is about coming to terms with unresolvable isness. I'll put it that way. Okay. Next question, please. Thank you. Thank you. I, I okay, can now let's shift to 1964. Scarlett and Mel, both in their teens, meet in high school in the Sacramento. Mel knows at first simply this girl is a year older, she wears black, she gets A's all the time without seeming to try, she plays the guitar, and she goes around looking distracted. She's impatient and blunt, and she makes brash pronouncements. Joan writes, Scarlett's words hinted at an alternate universe from Mel's point of view. So Mel writes a story about Scarlett for English class. She names her Fiona. So that's a little seedling there. And Scarlett? He sees Mel at the bus stop. She's shy. And as, as, as she listens to Scarlett, almost too rapt, too willing, Joan writes. It made Scarlett fidgety, for she knew the girl's awe of her was unmerited. Scarlett's own annoyance with this, in turn, distressed her, some unpleasant message about herself wrapped up in it. So we get a little feeling for the two of them. But even as the, these two teenagers are drawn together as friends, there's an ambiguity there. Ambiguity is one of the elements of friendship that keeps us intrigued. The scene we're going to hear from Joan tonight first is during this early time, Mel has invited Scarlett to her house for the first time and trust her enough to show her something very private. So here's the first section we're going to hear from the Outlook for Earthlings set in 1964. All right, thank you, Jane. The Scarlett is about 15 at this beginning of the novel and Melanie is about 14. Melanie has a younger brother and sister whom Scarlett has just met and are watching cautiously as Scarlett and Mel continue their tour of the house. Let me show you my father's office, Mel said, guiding her through the kitchen and up the stairs. Scarlett looked down as they climbed to see both children still watching through the spaces between the poles along the banister. The stairs led to a loft with slanted eaves lit by two white bubble skylights. Scarlett noted the desk, the typewriter, shelves of books, papers, her eyes traveled to the walls. Then she stood very still. The walls were covered with flesh. Everywhere, the telltale pink and rose of naked flesh, photographs of reclining women. 
pubic triangles, blooming areolas, brown, pink, rose. Flesh bloomed from open blouses, zipped down jeans, lingerie peeled away. A room-sized mural of flesh and nipple skin coagulated. If you didn't focus on any one spot, the images ran together like a photo collage of raw chicken parts glistening under shrink wrap. Except this meat had eyes, feet, hair, auburn, black, brown, blonde. Arms behind heads, glances heavy, sidelong. Mr. Taper had pasted centerfolds from Playboy and similar magazines over every available inch of his writing room. Oh, said Scarlett. Among the centerfolds were tacked small square pieces of paper with typing on them. Scarlett moved forward a step to read one. Dear Mr. Taper, we are sorry to inform you that despite its merits, at this time we are unable to accept. They were rejection slips, Mel said. Her father taught government at the college, but in spare time he wrote detective stories, crime novels. No one had taken anything yet. Scarlet turned from wall to wall. Oh, she said, turning. Oh, he fails. He's off the mark, she thought. This comprehension, like that of the children's predicament, also came without words. Tacking up the rejection notices, intended as cleverness as a kind of hollow last laugh, flagged itself instead as ham-handed, self-damning. She couldn't say why or how she knew these things. One fact was sure, the hillocks of flesh glowing from all sides, triangular dales of pubic forests were making her stomach start to pitch. A bright, bitter unhappiness was redolent in these walls, like tarnished copper in your mouth. Maybe, Scarlet thought, the notion sank sickeningly in her chest. Maybe this is what you have to do to be a writer. She turned to Mel for help. But Mel's eyes, meeting Scarlet's for a beat, conveyed a forbearance so deep and direct, it seemed casual. The way a person's eyes might quietly affirm, yes, my father has no legs. This is how it has always been. Shall we fix something to eat? They descended the stairs. Both understood they would not speak of Mr. Tabor's office again. Mel had shown Scarlet the room. Mel knew only what she'd been told. She watched her feet moving down the wooden stairs. Thanks, team. I can't get over that combination of Playboy centerfolds and rejection slips. <laughs> it's pretty okay. <laughs> um, Mel shares this secret with Scarlett. Scarlett absorbs it, and it is not spoken of again. How does this moment early in their lives shape this friendship? And what does it say about friends keeping secrets and how important that might be? Are you addressing me as their maker? Um, yeah. It strikes yes. me, it strikes me more that Scar Mel is showing Scarlett the reality of her life and it's an act of humility. I hadn't really thought about this from that angle, Jane, so thank you for that. Um, it's an act of humility and the forthrightness is part of the humility. And I don't think Mel has any idea that Scarlett will run off and tell people Mel's father's office is covered with naked women. But uh, I think Scarlett is genuinely amazed and astonished because both girls are still pretty young and haven't spent a lot of time in the world. Um, she is chastened by, I think as much by the man's apparent failure, which she intuits as much as by his predilection for soft porn. And I think above all, she something inside her in Scarlet is hurt by what Mel and the children and her brother and sister seem to have to endure in that household. And um, I hope that all this is subtly uh, un unfurled in the course of describing both families. But I think it's a moment when Scarlett is forced to face how the world works to a certain degree. And Mel is saying, here, here I am, which is very brave in its way. 
and and I think begins a level of intimacy that just accelerates over their lives. Yeah. Their lives do separate out for a while at this stage after they finish high school. Right. And then they come back together again. Like some of us who have relationships with people in high school and then you move away, you go somewhere, you get married, things happen. And then 1988, 20 some years later, Mel comes back and she looks up Scarlett. It's so interesting. And they reconnect. Yes. So it's 1988. Yes. Mel phones Scarlett and they arrange a date that Scarlett will drive to her little cottage in the back of uh, the suburban home in Sacramento. Scarlett lives in San Francisco. She's a columnist. She writes for the Chicago, Chicago Tribune and has a day job. Uh, Mel, well, there's, that's a mystery that remains to be uh, revealed. So Scarlett's in the cottage and they're preparing to talk. Scarlett opens the conversation. Okay, now we are gonna fill in some gaps. Scarlett leaned forward at the table. Walnut, it must be, dented and dark like a beloved old piano. Upon it, glasses of iced black currant tea, homemade carrot soup, these from Mel. The wheat bagels, organic wine, fake egg salad made of tofu, organic pears, red and green grapes, brick of Gruyere, rye crackers, tub of chive and garlic hummus, diet tonic water, kalamata olives, small package of baby carrots, organic Fuji apples, fresh squeezed orange juice, whole grain chocolate chip cookies, raw cashews, salted pistachios, low fat popcorn, menthol cough drops in case throats got sore from talking. These were from Scarlett. Hang on. So let's hear it, Scarlett commanded. Her voice reverberated in her throat, full alto. She enjoyed the feel of it. One of Scarlett's elbows rested on the table, the other propped a fist against her cheek. She wore old jeans softened from a thousand washings, the whole of the knee, a blue and white grid of strings over bare skin, a cotton t-shirt, dark cherry. She'd owned these clothes for more years than she could remember. I know it must seem strange, Mel said. I had reason though. God, how you baffle me, said Scarlet. I can't think of a single place I'd want less to see again. It's full of fat air here. Scarlet had not changed, Mel thought. Years of travel and sun lined her complexion, but her carriage remained girlish. Same large flouncing movements, same big pronouncements. Her face morphed a dozen times a minute, just as it had when they were girls. Her voice, like her face, remade itself, now throaty, now clear. And Scarlet still spoke in startling compilations of words, tossed like confetti around the room. She said, indubitably and swell, lugubrious and groovy and geez marie's. She spoke like a diplomat, a beatnik, a pirate. It is to be hoped and crappity crap, elucidate and holy moly. Mel remembered high school bus rides, words like these leaping from her friend's mouth. She dried a couple of spoons. I saw this place differently by then, Mel said. Scarlet stretched forward, cocked head propped by a fist. She had slipped off her loafers, curled bare feet around the chair legs, leaning forward, spine long, anticipation traveling it like a current. Very well, mystery woman, nice dance of the veils. Now let's have it in technicolor, please. I want details. Mel seated herself, took a sip of tea. The violin and piano on the tape followed sweetly flowing parallel paths. Wait, dwell, time. A pale vision, Scarlet was thinking. More self-possessed, Mel was. Less of the girl at the bus stop, moony then, hugging her books as if they were a shield. This face, more composed, screamed off. Mel set her glass down with both hands, looked up, met Scarlet's eyes. I came back for someone, she said. So I'm gonna to move to a craft question for you, Joan. Okay. Because you are 
covering so many levels of time as we move forward this evening, everyone will see how far, but both from 1964 to 2013 overall. And you include so many stages of things in this friendship. How do you set up the weaving back and forth from one decade or period to the next? Did you just this figure out your structure in advance or did you discover it as you went along? Well, thanks for that. I, I, don't, I don't remember setting, setting it up in advance, but I do remember scenes occurring to me that needed to be told in that particular order. And then it fell to me to have to figure out when in time they had occurred. So post facto, I made a timeline, but post, oh. not pre. And I had a heck of a time with it, a terribly difficult time trying to arrive at exactly what year, what happened and who was how old. Um, but I seem to have arrived at something that seems to work. It was, that was very difficult. I think I, I responded to the scenes that wanted to be told first um, and then tried to order them in terms of labeling later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the chronology. Yeah. Fascinating. So the time now, came you, later. Sorry? It, you know, it came later. So now would you give us a glimpse? We've, we've seen the reunion. Give us a glimpse of the early days of Mel's love affair with Saul from the year 1971. I feel like the music should kick in now. Oh, I know, you know. We do need a soundtrack. <laughs> we need a soundtrack. I would adore yeah. a soundtrack. Uh, I, I have yeah. a lot of fun picking out a soundtrack for what, for this. Yeah. Uh, we should let listeners know who, who aren't familiar with the novel that um, that Mel came back for the a university professor who was married, whom she had loved, named Saul. And Solomon Armentino, a very, very powerful, charismatic, commanding, leonine man. And she fell completely for him. Um, the, it's a tangled web, but she eventually makes her way back to him. So she's back in the cottage now and they have an arrangement. He goes to see her every Saturday. Uh, his wife thinks he's running errands and chores and it's all constructed by him. And this was how it typically went. Saul would phone, suggest a time. Mel would re-rig her schedule however necessary, skip class, even rehearsals. Once home, she would rush about to clean the place, throwing everything loose, clothes, dirty dishes, mail, into the closet, into drawers, under the bed. Once, panicked for time, she pushed the loose things into a large green plastic garbage sack, knotted it and shoved it into the back seat of the car. All that she left visible in the studio was a white ceramic bowl filled with water on which she'd float a single blossom, whatever she could find, a rose, a camellia, a sprig of star jasmine. When Saul arrived, she would stand back from the door like a hat check girl, accept his jacket, her rib cage always frozen, heart clattering. She would have tea ready. He seldom drank alcohol and never during the day with a little plate of muffins or slices of pound cake. There was no table in the studio. They sat on stools at the pink tiled counter, which she had polished to a painful shine. He would take a few bites. Much later, he would explain kindly, he had to watch his cholesterol. Mel could not eat in his presence. She might nibble a corner of cake, erode it. After he left, she devoured everything that was left, rapidly standing up. They sipped hot tea. In those days, tea was not available in its present infinite varieties. I should back up here and say that this affair was occurring when Mel was a, a student and Saul was a teacher, not, not post, not later when she comes back for him. Okay. Constant comment, hoping he'd find it refreshing. He made no protest, but neither did he praise it. His presence, so unlikely, so huge in that small room, it may as well have been Poseidon sitting on the stool beside her, sipping tea, an outsized prong scepter propped up against the kitchen wall. She could smell this man the moment he was near, she would later tell Scarlet. That man musk, it made her legs weak. After minutes of sipping, 
shoulder to shoulder at the countertop, minutes bulging with silence like physical pain, her awe and longing such that she thought she might faint, he would suddenly turn and reach to kiss her. And in what seemed a single motion, stand them both up and guide them, her stepping backward to the bed. Her head would begin to roar. She was aware of him moving above her. At first, she was frightened to look at his face, but once or twice, she opened her eyes and saw a rictus of concentration. He was 42, she 21. In a trance beneath his weight, believing she felt something surge in her alongside the climax of his heaving. That surge to her lit a filament at soul's center, a white incandescence. She believed that inside that white zenith, souls fused ever so briefly. It was the ineffable thing, she thought, wholly separating us from animals. So this begins in 1971 and continues in such an interesting way, which you have to read the book to figure out. But we're going to move forward a little bit now to after Mel and Scarlett had their reunion in 1985. We're going to look at the year 1995, 10 years later. Mel and Scarlett are still friends 10 years later, and Saul and Mel are still together. And in this chapter, I'm going to ask Joan to read sections from <laughs> Mel is cleaning her cottage in preparations for a visit from Saul. And she's mulling over the friendship she has had with Scarlett these years. It's 1995. These are perfect intros, Jane. Thank you. It worked in two phases, Mel thought. She leaned to pull the bedspread taut. Things happened tugged a bottom corner, smoothed it. Events, conversations, dreams, phase one. Then phase two, you dealt out the memories, laid them neatly face up like cards on the desktop of the mind, lifted each image one by one, studied it, tried to con contact its essence, fit it into the larger tableau, like knitting the world in an outward direction concentrically, a stitch at a time except it would never do to place herself at any world's center. She straightened up, pressed her lower back, stared at the bed. Her back rippled with pain, a shifting network of little knives. She tried to think around it. Maybe her method was more like a spider's, awful image, except Scarlett did often call her Charlotte A. Cavatica when she wasn't calling her Jane Eyre or Dorothea or Madame de Vionnet. Mel moved to the top of the bed and yanked the spread tight. If you omitted the eating of bugs and in the private heaven of imagination, why ever not, the spider image worked, dwelling quietly in a shaded corner, invisible, relishing peace, buffered and camouflaged by webs, dreams taking over. Not that she loved spiders. She leaned to lift each pillow, shook them deeper into their cases, placed them back plump, russet against the quilted wine of the spread. She and Scarlett worked these phases over and over. It made up the meat of their friendship. Browse, select, think through, suggest a verdict, discuss, revise. 10 years it had been now since her return to this city, taking up life again, taking up Saul again, shakily at first. 10 years since her first phone call to Scarlett and Scarlett's first visit, the cherry shirt that had seemed to tint, to tint the room, the brown curls dusted with silver blue at their crown, jeans ripped at the knee. 10 full years Mel had never been certain she might actually have, bought with shark cartilage, tamoxifen, rounds of chemo, years that were gifts, but you couldn't stop wanting more. That was the terrible truth. The more you promised yourself to be satisfied with, just let me see Sonia graduate from high school, just let me have Paris with my girl. Once each milestone passed, you wanted more. What you had promised to be satisfied with became never enough. Unpretty greed. Yet could it be so wicked to long to open your eyes to a next morning, to the rain spattered leaves, to the deer stepping daintily in the garden? 
to look on Saul's face, hear his voice? Wow. Let's talk about time in that section. It's a craft question, but it's also something that this chapter does so well. It, essentially, it's a woman cleaning her house in preparation for a visit from her lover. Correct. But you make it expand so much. You give it such a sense of all the things that are going on. And I, I'm thinking about, even toward the end, you have, she begins to think about her younger self and she goes, you know, when you're young, you think, what will happen? Who will I be? And how it will turn out? Yes. And then suddenly at the end of this chapter, there's a shift, what you call a sudden punch to the heart that causes, it comes to her, who might you have been? Yes, and that's this exactly, is like yes. yes. Punch. In yes. writing this chapter, how would you go about slowing time down so that this, from the outside, a woman walking around her cottage and cleaning has all that depth and resonance and comes to that conclusion. Thank you for liking it. You slowed it, it down. You slowed it, it down. It's a lot of interiority that slows things down. And it happens to be my favorite gear to be in, interiority. Um, so oddly, ironically maybe, about interiority, it helps to start with objects, with the density of objects the innocence of objects, if you will. And so doing something as quotidian, as homely, as daily, as making a bed, washing a dish, na almost naturally for me, uh, incites or triggers or ignites um, vast ranging thoughts backward and forward in time. Who was I? What will I become? And, um, I, uh, it's, a, it's a mode that I adore being in and it's a mode that I adore reading. So in that regard, I think I, I fulfill the uh, sometimes heard suggestion that people write what they like to read. Um, I, I love following, following a, a ranging interiority and there's great luxury in it. In fact, it's voluptuous in my, in my thinking. And yet it's, it's bookended by humble, simple, solid objects like, you know, fluffing and plumping a pillow and laying a fork down. And there's a great satisfaction, I think, in that, uh, that balance. But time comes then from the freedom of interiority, ranging across time comes from a, a complete feeling of freedom to, to, to range that far, if that makes any sense. I hope it does. <laughs> makes sense. It makes sense. And we're to stay now in 1995 because we have Scarlett's reaction to Saul, which is one of those moments, one of those elements in this book. I mean, it's like a triangle with the three of them because <laughs> the women love each other so much, but Saul is really in the middle there. Um, so at the heart of the disconnect between these two, um, and he's a married man and he hides her from the world yes and scarlet's frustrated by this yes um remember, yes, remember? Scarlet, yeah, as well yeah feminism is so, coming into its own then and uh scarlet can't believe the anachronism that mel and her relationship to saul seems permanently stuck in she's beside herself uh, exasperated and and loves mel with all her heart knows she'll seldom find a, pure, a, a, a more, how shall I say, innocent repository of goodness, and yet at the same time distrusts, distrusts that goodness because Mel gives hints that Saul's arrogance and monomania hurt her. Oh, and his hiding her away, not least. So here's a little section where, once again, Mel tries to tell Scarlett something about what's going on with Saul and Scarlet gets crazy, crazy angry at her. Scarlet had exploded when Mel confessed that Saul had never complimented her. Mel had actually had to hold the receiver away from her ear. Are you kidding? What is he thinking? How could any man withhold like that? Does he go in for punishment as recreation? A sharp lecture had followed on Mel's serious beauty. Lit from within radiance 
Scarlett invoked all the literary heroines and actresses. Sweetheart, listen to me. You are Dorothea. You are Jane Eyre. Olivia de Havilland. You are, you are the blue fairy for God's sake. What can he even be thinking? Then Scarlett tried to calm herself as she always did after such outbursts, knowing Mel would not only not be moved by shouts, expletives, clever insults, but that she'd become wounded on Saul's behalf and withdraw. Scarlett switched to theatrical patience as one might talk to a child. She begged Mel to see her logic. These go rounds always tired Mel. Touched by Scarlett's loyalty, crude as it was, she felt she owed her friend a response that would justify it. No such response existed in Mel. Scarlett was shocked by this, she knew. It was an impasse like no other. They could not pierce it. And yet, as we think forward into this beautiful book, Scarlett is there for Mel as her life goes on and as her life ebbs. Because she struggles with cancer through very many years of treatment and many adventures. And, and there's even a point where Scarlett takes Mel and her daughter to Paris for an adventure. And it's so beautiful and lovely. You know the line and I then, love, Jane? I love the line, yeah. let's, go over, let's go over to Flaubert's house. Oh, yeah, let's go to Paris. Very cool. It was great. Um, I know. Yeah, we don't have forever, so. Okay, um, let's go. I'm I, mean, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm thinking, I know we want to talk about the dream and then you have the Socratic thing, but. We, we can, let, we can, we can drop any of this. We can drop. All right, how about we move forward to that moment, the extraordinary passage that shows how the friendship between Scarlett and Mel transcends time because Scarlett has a dream. And in this case, we're in the year 2004. It's toward the end of the book, but I think it's okay to give a little spoiler here. It's so beautiful in its sense of the connection between these two women that's already been many decades. And it gives a sense of time, which is another thing that you're dealing with throughout this book, this amazing sense of time as it as it you know expands and 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 it moves back and forth and so forth so the last reading that is part of our kaleidoscope is called it's really a dream okay thanks jane the year 2004. thanks melanie came to scarlet just before dawn without fanfare in a hotel room in albuquerque new mexico Finn had insisted on a spring vacation that year. He was happy, generous. The high desert air clear and dry. The sky, a vast saturated turquoise, a depthless vibrating. They had rented a car, wandered Santa Fe, Taos, driven miles of desert, walked the concrete plazas in hot sun, bought trinkets, drunk beer, tequila. Scarlet found cheap earrings shaped like tiny red chili peppers. She looked at postcards, stared into photos of rock strong faces, warriors, children. She saw those same faces along the walkways, placid, selling jewelry, wares. She and Finn wandered pottery shops, fingered carpets, listened to birdsong. Air was warm, scented with cactus blossoms. They peered into room after room of terrible paintings. Well-groomed waitresses, clerks smiled at them. They found a museum full of ancient looms arrowheads, vessels of woven reeds. They read charts, hand-lettered displays explaining the formations of mesas and canyons, the vastness of geologic time. In the evenings after dinner, Finn had a scotch. Sky deepened to electric teal. Strings of white lights hung in their lace patterns outside adobe facades. Finn planted little kisses on her shoulder as they walked. It moved Scarlet to see him happy, strolling, solicitous. But she never stopped seeing Mel in the bland movements of day, the dusty shops and streets, patches of hot green grass, blood and gold marigolds, poppies. At night, she heard Mel's cool voice. 
She cried out for Mel in dreams, woke sweaty, jaws sore from clenching. The world was itself, yet no longer itself, papery, dulled without the musical voice, the lake blue eyes, the apprising mind in its quiet corner. It happened toward the last hours of their last night in an old hotel made of dark wood called La Posada. The air conditioner shirring, sounds of street traffic muffled from outside. In the bed, Scarlet turned and turned, flung herself into every position that had ever soothed her. Finn lay oblivious on his side, released from consciousness by brandy, food, heat. Near dawn, Scarlet fell into an exhausted sleep. Amid the mute moving shadows and murk, like a white hologram, stood Melanie. She was tall, young, looking at Scarlet with open eyes, cerulean blue. Her brown hair soft, short and curly as it had been the first day they'd resumed when she'd walked toward Scarlet's car in the spring wind beneath the giant fir tree. She stood now in a plain white sleeveless gown, quiet, calm. Melanie. It was as if Scarlet's anguish had dug down and down, dug and clawed, shivering and crying, till at last it touched the surface of the sought thing, snatched up now and held close, rocked in the blindness of dark. Melanie. Without speaking, Mel answered in words. Here I am. See, it's okay, Mel said, though her mouth never moved and there was no sound. It's okay. There is something you need to know. The heavy air drifted with indistinct shapes, patterns, shadows. Finn remained drowned in sleep, snoring softly, rolled off to one side of the bed. Scarlet groped for her own voice, crying out without sound in thick dawn. What is it, my dearest? Oh, please, what? Mel's eyes, full of light, direct, clear. Bare arms at her sides, mouth still. Saul was the thing, Melanie said. I never, never misrepresented that to you. And, she said, her eyes steady on Scarlet's, he was enough. Do not trouble yourself. He was enough. Scarlet woke and looked about, filled with wonder. Thank you, Jane. The friendship goes on. It's such a comforting passage. Hmm. Were you comforted by it when you wrote it? I think a, a little bit mollified. And as anyone who's got one eye in their head can probably tell this is a deeply personal novel for me. And I'm not sure myself of what the formal definition of autofiction is, but um, I guess this would probably qualify. Um, I, should, I will also disclose that it was written a while ago and it took me a very long time to find a publisher because my belief is um, it's difficult. <laughs> but the way I see it is that it's not unlike a novel with all modesty that I've admired very much for many years, which is John Williams's matchless novel, Stoner. And the reason for that is both novels chart a life that is very quiet, utterly obscure, unacknowledged, unnoticed, unheralded, un unpraised for the most part. And yet by the end, you're aware in both lives of a radiance, a radiance of self-awareness in both characters that own those obscure, unacknowledged lives. And I think some of that, if we are lucky when we are reading, transmutes to the reader as a larger vision of a way to come to terms with the time, the brief time we're given on this planet, how to see ourselves and our beloveds. It is a riddle, uh, and it's like Whitman's statement, it contains multitudes. Um, it contains contradictions simultaneously. 
but I think in the end, it's an effort, a work I hope like this one and like Williams's Stoner to, to get at the marrow of, of how to be given the strange array of givens each of us receives during our time here. I hope that makes some sense. And in the end also, how love is the irreducible remaining element, irreducible. And that may be the, the biggest comfort of all, I think. Oh, thanks. May we, may we raise a glass? Cheers. Oh. May we raise a glass? Here's my England cup. Scarlet and Mel. <laughs> to Scarlet and name. Mel. Very nice. And Joan, who has brought them to life for us. And who now will take questions and will actually also sign your books if you arrange for that this evening. I think we need to give some time for questions. Jamie, are the questions in the chat box? Yes, they I'll are. Okay. Them? All right. Joan, are you ready for questions? Uh, here I am. Yeah. Okay. From Gary Christ. How does your writing process differ when you're writing fiction and nonfiction? Good Hi, question, because you've won awards this, just this year for both fiction and nonfiction. Hi, Gary. Thanks for that. Um, they are two, they're two different voices, and they come from different dimensions. And um, the, the, the dimension of fiction, in my experience anyway, I don't mean to speak for others, has its own set of internal physical laws, which are very smooshy and porous and spongy and gushy and systems of gravity are not the same and invocations of time are not the same. It's all very twilight zone in the world of fiction. Whereas nonfiction in some ways as a relief comes as a relief because it's, it's more on the ground. Uh, it can convey interior life and dreams, but it has to obey certain unilaterally agreed upon laws of, of, of life on earth. And the, writing in both voices relieves the pain for a little while of having written in the other voice. But thanks, Gary, for that, that lovely question. Here's another one. Um, oh, by the way, Iris Dunkel says, great job, Joan. It's good to hear you read your work. Yay. Imagine she's coming up instead of, you know. Um, Scott Wheeler asks, your favorite gear. That's brilliant, and I totally get it from this work. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, I, Scott's a, a brilliant composer, and one of my great joys in friendship with him is talking about music in literature and, and in life. Um, this book, by the way, is full of music, and I hope people will notice that and, and love it. Um, in fact, I hope the narrative itself is a kind of music, but it's, a, it's wonderful to have a bona fide composer, composer's uh, thoughts about discussions of music, descriptions of music, I, I must say that I find writing about music one of the most difficult challenges of my, of my writing life. And yet I thrash about trying to do it right every time. Okay. Kate Clayton asked, I wonder if Saul would have been, been enough had Melanie not had such a rich friendship with Scarlett. Hmm. That's a very. She said she hasn't read the book. Hmm. I don't. I don't know. Um. I, I. don't think. I don't think Scarlett would have had one thing or another to do with it. I think Melanie was absolutely ironclad in her devotion to him, even to the point, even if it killed her. And so Scarlett was a connection that was helpful to her, nourishing and supportive. Um, but such was the nature of Mel's commitment. If you read this novel, you'll see the, the essential riddle that hogties Scarlet in this friendship, which is that, this is the dark part, Melanie lays little hints down about how Scott, uh, Saul nearly kills her a lot of the time. And Scarlet can't not read that as a cry for support, help, enabling of some kind. 
But when she tries, Mel refuses. Scarlett calls it the equivalent of dropping a little hanky in the old fashioned, the way they did in the old fashioned days when a woman wanted a man to pay attention to her. Scarlett thought that Mel wanted Scarlett to save her by dropping a little hanky of SOS signals. It didn't turn out to be so. It's a, it's a great riddle. It's a great, it's never solved. Ron says, it's wonderful to hear you read from the book, Joan. Can you talk about different ways you see and convey time in fiction? Well, I think you drop in, whenever you write fiction, you drop deeply into a dream. And then you be very patient, as you know, Ron, because you've just finished your first novel about which I'm so excited. Um, in the dream, I, I, at least for me, I, I don't know if it's this way for you, Ron, uh, the, the conveyance of time suggests itself if you are if you feel free enough to range freely it suggests itself so somehow the body or the mind or the soul or the nervous system knows when to abandon the minute by minute and fly into the omniscient oh look at this we're looking at 50 50 years or a hundred years. It's dictated, in other words, by idiosyncratic urgency. How's that? That's the best I can do that's, on a dime. That's good. Iris Dunkel asked, where did you find the inspiration to write this story? My life. My life and my anguish um, and my determination that the story should not be lost. Because James Salter the amazing James Salter said, yeah. uh, and I was gonna use this as an epigraph, but Salter kindly told me he meant to use it himself. There comes a time when you realize that everything is a dream, quoting Salter now, and only those things in writing, preserved in writing, manage to stay real. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And it strikes me that Salter nailed it. It's true. And even if books get old and smelly and crackly and you're, in used book boxes, somehow they are found like a message in a bottle. I really truly believe that. And they speak even if only to one soul that will have been worth it, I think. As, as books and they, all of us who read and write, back. yeah. They come back too. There are so many wonderful books that are being reissued over right. time as well. They come back. So it's, it's, yeah. it's like speaking speaking to the portraits in a gallery and them speaking back. Sarah Stone wants to know, there's so much immediacy in the passages of interiority. Do you find yourself working in revision with your sentences on distance closeness or formality directness? Oh my goodness, Sarah, those are very exacting demands. And I don't know that I bring that heavy a, a weapon with me into revising. I think all I want when, I, when I'm revising is for the words to follow each other in a graceful, powerful way and, and to convey the urgency of the vision in each sequential moment. I guess that's the best way I can say it. Um, I, again, very idiosyncratic and very urgent. Um, and I guess if someone I gave it to, I give, I, when I'm done, I give it the manuscript, maybe just to a couple of pairs of eyes because I've learned to only trust a couple of pairs of eyes. And if they say something about those issues, then I'll take another look, but otherwise I've just got to trust myself and, and the music of the narrative. It's, about, it's, it's, a, it's a form of music to me. It's a form of music, I think, yeah. Elizabeth Fischel wants to know, has a question. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, the character of Saul is reminding me of the famous man in the first novella of Where You're All Going, your novella collection that came out earlier this year. Is this a theme for you? And How? congrats on this cool book. And she says, hi to Jane from across the decades. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> hi, hi so Elizabeth. Is, is there a tie in to the famous man in the first novella? That's so in interesting. Hi, Elizabeth, thanks for showing up. And um, there was no conscious tie, but it interests me that you noticed it because I think I grew up in a generation where 
alpha men really messed with people. <laughs> and they certainly as hell messed with me. And, and I'm still working through that and working that out. I think it's, it's just was a fact of life that I think Kate, what was her last name? She wrote a novel called The Famous Man, which I haven't read yet. Um, oh, Atkinson? Kate Atkinson? Oh. Yes, I think. Is that it? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, it, it is a, it's a rather, it's an image that begs to be taken apart and examined at a molecular level and, and reconstructed in some way that makes any kind of new sense to the, to the examiner. Um, so yeah, Felix in Where You're All Going and Saul absolutely have alpha male qualities in common. The most interesting that you, that you found that. And thanks again, Elizabeth. Um, multiple people want to know, how do they buy this book? <laughs> okay, Jamie. 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 <laughs> Take it away. Jamie. I am so Jamie. glad you asked that. That was a wonderful, a wonderful evening. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank I just you realized too. it's Joan, Jane, and Jamie. We've got them all. I know. <laughs> um, so for all of you, we're doing something special with Joan because we love her at Copperfields. We're going to have... Um, you send me an email to purchase the book. It's doing so well that it's on back order right now and they're in a reprint. So what we're gonna do is set it up to where we order the copies, have Joan come in. She's gonna do a signing, any personalizations, and it's gonna be great. We'll either work it out where you pick it up in store at the, at the location of your preference, or we can mail it. So, um, I just put my email in there. There will also be an email that goes out tomorrow with more information. So be on the lookout. Terrific. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Oh, and I, I will definitely bring this because I Oops. have to hold it up. And I upside I down. <laughs> <laughs> I have to bring it in because last time you were with us, I didn't get a chance to get mine signed. So. Oh, God, I'll be happy to do that. Awesome. Very happy. Awesome. Well, thank Listen, you thank you guys so much. It was really, really good. I'm very, very grateful and relieved as can be. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks to everybody who showed up. Really happy. Oh, glad. Have a good Cheers. day. Cheers.